Good evening and welcome to my bibliotherapy session tonight, which is going to be on the subject of earthquakes. I am choosing this subject for the clear reason that we're going to be um, trying to raise money for the earthquake, for the appeal for money for um, people in Syria and Turkey. So anyone that comes to this session, please, if you have a moment, nip over to Action Aid UK or the um, British Red Cross and do make a donation of anything you can, even if it's a tiny amount. No amount is too small to help the poor people in Syria and Turkey who've been affected by the earthquakes. So as a welcome distraction, perhaps, we're going to be talking about earthquakes in literature. At these times, we do need real consolation in the form of food, water, emergency services and rescue. But as Professor David Ulin suggests, who is the author of The Myth of Solid Ground, Earthquakes, Prediction and the Fault Line Between Reason and Faith, we also need literature to turn to in our hour of need. And although these might not be the books that you would want to read if you are in an earthquake, they are books that will help us to understand earthquakes and empathise with the people that have been caught up in this terrible earthquake that's just occurred. For as long as we have experienced seismicity, which is a difficult word to say, we have written about it going back to the book of Acts. Do you, do you remember that there's an earthquake in the book of Acts? I'd actually forgotten that until I started looking into it earlier today. Um, in the book of Acts, there's a rather wonderful verse. I am using the modern version, I'm afraid not um, a more ancient version. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, a strong earthquake shook the foundations of the prison. At once, all the doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, presuming that the prisoners had escaped. You'll be glad to hear that he didn't kill himself. But that, in the book of Acts, the earthquake there is a rather convenient earthquake that helps the doors to flow, fly open and everyone's chains come loose. However, we're going to be talking about not so pleasant or convenient earthquakes in literature, starting off with the Earthquake in Chile by Heinrich von Kleist, which was originally published in 1807. He's a German novelist and it takes place during the 1647 Santiago earthquake, which ends tragically with a young couple killed after having been blamed in a sermon for the disaster. But Kleist in this novel had a bigger purpose in writing this work of literature, which was to highlight the idea that meaning is a matter of interpretation, that what we know is what we see. And here's a quote from the book, translated, of course. Only when he turned and saw the city levelled to the ground behind him, did he remember the terrifying moments he had just experienced. He bowed his forehead to the very ground as he thanked God for his miraculous escape. And as if this one appalling memory stamping itself on his mind, had erased all others, he wept with rapture to find that the blessing of life in all its wealth and variety was still his to enjoy. And this is, a, uh, as you would not be surprised, a recurring theme in many of these earthquake literature examples that people are counting their lucky stars, that they have survived the earthquake. Ooh, and I do seem to be getting bad connections. Sorry about that. Um, so moving on, I'm afraid that I am leaping back and forth through literature. There's no particularly um, 
logical framework to this evening's chat in terms of a timeline. But this one, The Flutter of an Eyelid by Myron Grinnig, was published in 1933. And it's a great modernist fantasy set in Los Angeles, um, although it's essentially unread today. It's one of those slightly forgotten books. The Flutter of an Eyelid. Great title. Um, I must admit I haven't read it. It's one that I came across in my researches, but I love the name. The book ends with a massive earthquake in which the entire state of California breaks off from North America and crumbles into the Pacific. Los Angeles toboggans with almost one continuous movement into the water. The shore cities going first, followed by the inland communities, the business streets, the buildings, the motion picture studios in Hollywood, where actors became stark and pallid under their mustard coloured makeup. We get the feeling that Myron Grinnig was not a fan of Hollywood. So that was written in 1933, and it was obviously a response to the Long Beach earthquake of 1933. And then we've got another one, which was written at the same time, called The Folklore of Earthquakes by Carey McWilliams, which is a clear-eyed guide to what we might call earthquake myths and the powerful terror that their shaking provokes. On the basis of their reaction to the word earthquake, writes Carrie McWilliams, Californians can be divided into three classes. First, the innocent late arrivals who've never felt an earthquake, but who go on about a bowing to all and sundry that it must be fun. Next, those who've experienced a slight quake and should know better, but who nonetheless persist in propagating the fable that the San Francisco quake of 1906 was the only major upheaval the state has ever suffered. And lastly, the victims of a real earthquake, for example, the residents of San Francisco, Santa Barbara, or more recently, Long Beach. To these last, the word is full of terror. They are super sensitive to the slightest rattles and jars and move uneasily whenever a heavy truck passes along the highway. So that's supposedly the three types of people and how they react to earthquakes. I was really cold when I started this session, hence all my many layers, and I'm going to now slightly disrobe because I'm getting quite hot with the animation of talking about these earthquakes in literature. So anyone that's joining now, do please consider donating to Action Aid UK or to the Red Cross. Um, I have put a donate button on my story and also on Facebook and um, any tiny amount of um, whatever you can give will be hugely helpful. So now we're going to move on to Ask the Dust by John Fante, which is not really an earthquake book, but it is a book that has an earthquake in it. Um, and I'm just remembering that I should have done something going through my screen to turn around the book. It always works on Facebook. Something I need to sort out. Sorry about that. So, John Fante's Ask the Dust, which is a 1939 novel, generally regarded as a cornerstone of Southern California literary canon. Fante, in this book, describes the struggles of a young man named Arturo Bandini. Sorry about the connection, which keeps dropping off. Who, which is based directly on himself. In one particularly memorable set piece, this is in Ask the Dust, um, Bandini survives the Long Beach earthquake, so that's the moment when the earthquake comes into this book, which he interprets as divine retribution for his sins. You did it, Arturo, he reflects. This is the wrath of God. You did it. Repent, repent before it's too late. I said a prayer, but it was dust in my mouth. No prayers. But there would be some changes made in my life. There would be decency and gentleness from now on. This was the turning point. And you'll have to read the book to see if he really does change his life around. And by the way, this uh, particular version does have 
an introduction by Charles Bukow Bukowski and um, John Dante was a great admirer of Bukowski's work and they um, hung out together quite a lot and vice versa, Bukowski admired Dante's work. So if you are a fan of John Bukowski, you would very likely also love John Dante. Give it a go. Um, so we've had some books from the 1930s about earthquakes. Now we've got one set in the late 1960s, it's written in 1974, which is Quake by Rudolf Wurlitzer, which is set in Hollywood. It's a phantasmagoria that unfolds across the landscape of a broken city in which narrative, never solid to begin with, has deserted the survivors of a massive earthquake. It's going to be a long day, one man says to another, amidst the wreckage of the Tropicana Motel. But if we're not dead now, we probably won't be. I'm hemorrhaging or something. I'll wait here. You forget me and I'll come after you. Everything is in my wallet. Room six. I got credit cards. That's Quake by Rudolf Wurlitzer, set in the 1960s. That's one of those moments where you are definitely thinking, are credit cards, cards going to be any good to you? Probably not in this scenario. Um, and it's a bit of an action type novel. Um, I do apologise about my connection. I don't know what's going on this evening. So, uh, we do have quite a lot of these novels and pieces of literature which are set in the States and California. Partly, of course, because we, we don't tend to get luckily earthquakes in the UK um, we occasionally get very gentle tremors but unfortunately California and the States is they're much more common so in this 1999 book which is called five fires race catastrophe and the shaping of California Wyatt makes a case for fire as the central social shaping mechanism in California history, tracing five events in particular, including the Great San Francisco Earthquake and Fire of 1906. With the earthquake and fire, he writes, San Francisco began the immediate translation of the text into the myth, that particular story that Fr San Francisco told itself about the earthquake and fire was of a city coolly eyeing its own destruction, a city act acting casual as Catherine Hume describes a man, blowing drifting chaff in his hands, casual when you knew he wasn't feeling so. So that's a book called Five Fires, Race, Catastrophe and the Shaping of California, which is a really interesting book that talks about how five massively dramatic events shaped California as a place and as a consciousness, and with particular reference to the earthquake and fire of 1906. And talking of which, there's another excellent novel, which is for younger readers called I Survived the San Francisco Earthquake, 1906, which is from this series of novels, um, which are very short. There's actually 20 in the series, and they're all written by Lauren Tarshis. Um, and they're actually brilliant novels. I'll just give you a few examples. I Survived the Japanese Tsunami, also relevant when we're talking about earthquakes. I Survived the Destruction of Pompeii. I Survived the Sinking of the Titanic. I Survived the Joplin Tornado, Hurricane Katrina, the Shark Attacks of 1916, and there are many more and they're really gripping reads which are the books that got my daughter into reading when she first really got gripped by books these were the first ones and it was actually the titanic that she first was obsessed by so i survived the san francisco earthquake of 1906 is as you can see an easy read aimed at young readers 
and it's highly gripping and it does tell you all about the earthquake of 1906. They're very educational. They're published by Scholastic. I'll read you the back because it gives you a good inkling of what it's about. And if anyone's got younger readers in their midst, this is a really great introduction to a, fi a fictionalised version of a real earthquake. It's quite hairy. Leo loves being a newsboy in San Francisco. He needs the money, but the job also gives him the freedom to explore the amazing hilly city as it grows with the new century. Horse-drawn carriages share the streets with shiny automobiles. Businesses and families move in every day from everywhere and anything seems possible. But early one spring morning, everything changes. Leo's world is shaken, literally, and he finds himself stranded in the middle of San Francisco as it crumbles and burns to the ground. Can Leo survive this devastating disaster? Well, we know he does because of the title. And I will also just read you a little bit from the beginning to show you how dramatic the book is. And by the way, all of these books start with an incredibly dramatic chapter when they're right in the middle of the events. And then they go back and they give you the facts leading up to the situation, but in a very readable and entertaining way. April 18, 1906. Rincon Hill, 5.12 a.m., San Francisco, California. The sky was still dark when the ground began to shake. Most people in San Francisco were still sleeping. Just a few were awake. Shopkeepers arranged their stores, getting ready for the day. Carriage drivers fed their horses. Newsboys ran down the sidewalk to pick up their newspapers to sell. And 11-year-old Leo Ross was in a broken-down building high on Rincon Hill. When the rumbling started, Leo thought it might be thunder. He had no idea that deep below the city, two gigantic pieces of earth were pushing past each other. Powerful shocks exploded up through the underground layers of dirt and rock. All across the city, streets ripped open, buildings swayed, walls crumbled and houses came crashing down. Broken glass, hunks of wood and piles of bricks tumbled into the streets. Leo stood in shock as the floor beneath him rose and fell like ocean waves. Hunks of plaster hit him on the head. Windows shattered, spraying glass all around. He tried to scream, but his throat was coated with dust. He wanted to run, but he couldn't even stand. The shaking was too hard. And then there was a sound like an explosion. The ceiling above his head burst open. A brick hit him smack on the back, and then another thud hit him in the shoulder. Crash! Dozens of bricks poured down. Leo fell to the floor and curled into a ball. The bricks kept coming, raining down. He couldn't see. He couldn't breathe. Soon, he would be buried alive. It's incredibly dramatic and really rather moving. Um, and it also has really good illustrations through the book. And at the end of the book, there's also rather useful facts telling you all about um, earthquakes generally and about um, it's got other earthquake facts and it's also got more about San Francisco. So that's a really great book for younger readers and I'm going to have a, a few more books for younger readers later on. So anyone joining now, by the way, do nip over and do a donation, if you can, of any tiny amount to ActionAid UK or to Oxfam or to British Red Cross or to any of the many groups who are helping at the moment in Syria and Turkey. Um, and that's why I'm doing this session tonight, to encourage people, um, if you haven't donated already, or even if you have, if you can donate a few quid more then anything is going to be hugely helpful. After the Quake by Haruki Murakami is another collection of stories written in reaction to the Kobe earthquake, which killed more than 6,000 people on January the 17th, 1995. Although in many of the pieces in this book, After the Quake, um, the earthquake 
plays quite a small part, a peripheral part, you might say. It re reverberates through the book like an aftershock. Five straight days she spent in front of the television, Murakami writes in UFO in Kushiro, one of the stories, staring at crumbled banks and hospitals, whole blocks of stores in flames, severed rail lines and expressways. She never said a word, sunk deep in the cushions of the sofa, her mouth clamped shut. She wouldn't answer when Kimura spoke to her. She wouldn't shake her head or nod. Kimura could not be sure the sound of her voice was even getting through to her. So that's Haruki Murakami, um, who wrote this selection of stories called After the Quake, and they were in response to the um, Kobe earthquake in 1995. And he, many of you will know, is a very beloved contemporary writer who wrote Capital on the Shore, The Wind-Up Third Chronicle, and many other brilliant novels. And he's also done quite a few more political pieces of writing over the years. He also wrote his book about running, what I think about when I think about running. Um, and he was obviously stirred to respond to the terrible earthquake, which uh, was translated by his very frequent collaborator and translator, Jay Rubin and it was published in 2002 in England. They're all stories which are just about ordinary people, some of which are set in places very far away from the original earthquake, which was the beginning, the catalyst to this, this book, but all of them ultimately refer to the earthquake and the way that it's affected people and the way that it affected them weeks, months and years later, and this is the terrible thing about earthquakes, how they continue to have their aftershocks in people's lives years later. There have been many other literary responses to earthquakes in Japan, because unfortunately earthquakes in Japan are not uncommon. The earthquake of 2011, which was the Tohoku, sorry, Tohoku, earthquake, which was the most powerful earthquake in recorded history to hit Japan, happened at 2.46 in the afternoon of March the 11th, 2011. This earthquake caused Japan to move east closer to North America by 13 feet, which is a pretty insane fact to think that an earthquake actually made a whole country move 13 feet closer to North America, and the earthquake accelerated the rotation of the Earth. I didn't know that that could even happen, that an earthquake could make the Earth move literally on its axis. This case study illuminates the multiplicity of disaster and the impossibility of separating a natural event from its many contexts and resonances. So that's talking about the many literary responses to the Tohoku earthquake of 2011, which was one of the biggest earthquakes in history. And some of these earthquakes have also been um, interpreted in a futuristic and science fiction related way, which we'll come to in a minute. But I'd also just like to mention Ruth Ozeki's tale for the time being, which was directly influenced by the earthquake of Tohoku that we were just mentioning. So Ruth Ozeki, who is a fantastic author, who I very much love, and she's written some excellent books recently, one of which is a, ta um, ta a tale for the time being, is the one we're talking about. There's also The Book of Form and Emptiness, which is a really fantastic novel. So this book, um, A Tale for the Time Being, is a book that she actually originally gave, gave in to her publishers as a completely different book. But then when the earthquake of Tohoku happened, she rescinded the manuscript and rewrote her novel, Grappling with Tohoku's Catastrophes from Across the Ocean. 
Ozeki discusses the novel as an exploration of how she could respond to catastrophes as a fiction writer. A Tale for the Time Being is an artefact of the earthquake culture in the Pacific Northwest because it was written in British Columbia. However, it contends the Japanese earthquake. It begins when a woman on a coastal island discovers in British Columbia discovers a package on the beach. The package contains the personal diary of a young girl in Japan. The woman in British Columbia is a writer named Ruth. Um, clearly there's a bit of autobiography going on there. Suffering from writer's block. Ruth is a character who represents the author of the novel, Ruth Ozeki. The novel is guided by the relationships between authors, readers and the texts that pass between them. And this is actually a common factor of Ruth Ozeki's work that she does like to bring the reader into the book and the whole concept of writing the book into the book. She's very much somebody that steps back from the writing of the book and makes it into metafiction. But she's nonetheless, although that makes her sound really intellectual and possibly a little bit off-putting, her books are incredibly readable and really fantastic and I highly recommend them. I'm just going to read you a little bit more about A Tale for the Time Being. Hi, my name is Mayo, and I am a time being. Do you know what a time being is? Well, if you give me a moment, I will tell you. Ruth discovers a Hello Kitty lunchbox washed up on the shore of her beach home in British Columbia. Within it lies a diary that expresses the hopes and dreams of a young girl. She suspects it might have arrived on a drift of debris from the 2011 tsunami. With every turn of the page, she is sucked deeper into an enchanting mystery. In a small cafe in Tokyo, 16-year-old Mayo Yasutani is navigating the challenges thrown up by modern life. In the face of cyberbullying, the mysteries of a 104-year-old Buddhist nun and great-grandmother and the joy and heartbreak of family, Mayo is trying to find her own place and voice through a diary she hopes will find a reader and friend who finally understands her. Weaving across continents and decades and exploring the relationship between reader and writer, fact and fiction, A Tale for the Time Being is an extraordinary novel about our shared humanity and the search for home. And um, I must say, of, of all the books I'm mentioning this evening, that might be one of my favourites. And thank you for making a donation. Anyone else that's um, joining at this point, do consider making a donation to either British Red Cross or Oxfam or um, Action Aid UK or there are lots of other fantastic organisations who are helping at the moment but um, those are the ones that I have been donating to. Captain Corelli's Mandolin. This is another fantastic novel with an earthquake in it. Um, and it's one of my favourites in this evening's discussion. It's one of the first ones that came into my mind because um, it's one of my favourite novels ever. So Captain Corelli's Mandolin, published in 1994, is set in 1941 when Captain Antonio Corelli, a young Italian officer, is posted to the Greek island of Cephalonia as part of the occupying forces. At first he's ostracised by the locals, but as a conscientious soldier whose main aim is to have a peaceful war, he proves in time to be civilised, humorous and a consummate musician. Is there anyone out there who has not read this book? It's such a fantastic, lovely and romantic book that I would totally urge you to go and read it now if you've never read it. You might have seen the film. The film is nowhere near as good as the book. Read the book. It does have quite a long and interesting beginning that puts some people off because there's this huge description of um, an excrescence being stuck in a man's ear and it goes into a great detail about that for the first probably 10 pages but once you've got beyond that it becomes incredibly funny moving brilliant 
and it does have an earthquake in it, though to be honest that's not a major part of the plot. Um, when the local doctor's daughter's letters to her fiancé go unanswered, the working of the eternal triangle seems inevitable. But can this fragile love survive as the war gets closer and the lines are drawn between invader and defender? So it is a wartime book set in 1941. Um, it's about the conflicting loyalties of the various protagonists in the novel. Captain Corelli, the young Italian officer, and the local doctor's daughter, Pelagia, who falls in love with him. They fall in love with each other. And the various other people involved. There's also a young, beautiful Greek man, Mandras, who is also in love with Pelagia. And he gets taken off to war and has a terrible transformation. There's a really in-depth book which has hugely brilliant characterizations, and I'm sure lots of you know the story. But um, I'll just read you a little bit about the earthquake moment. One morning, Pelagia is in awe when she finds the water at the top of the well. So the water's gone to the top of the well even though it quickly disappears. Dr. Yanis, her father, discovers his screwdriver is suddenly magnetic, and Antonia finds hedgehogs, owls, and other animals in plain sight outside. Dogs bay, things inexplicably fall over, and Drosula feels ill. Antonia also suffers a headache, but laughs as the cat races around. Antonia bursts into tears, cries that she has to get out, and runs outside. Suddenly the earth begins to plunge and shake. Dr. Yanis yells for Pelagia and Drusula to get out and they struggle for the door. They reach the door as the roof caves in and Dr. Yanis doesn't come out. And he's one of our favourite characters in the book. It's such a tragic moment. So I guess the earthquake is actually a massively important plot moment, but it's um, not a moment that's dwelt on in great detail by the author. However, the aftershocks of the earthquake obviously have a very long lasting result because many people's houses were destroyed, including Pelagia's house where she lived with her father, Dr. Yanis. The olive tree, which was outside their house, is split in half. Boulders have gone crashing down the hill and many people die. This is a really tragic moment in the story and I think a really horribly believable description of an earthquake. So Captain Corelli's Mandolin, do read it, absolutely fantastic novel, if you've never read it, pick it up and um, it's a highly splendid read. Now I'm going to just talk a little bit about young adult reads and books for younger readers um, about earthquakes or that touch on earthquakes. So we did mention I Survived, the San Francisco Earthquakes of 1906. There's one called The Disaster Days by Rebecca Behrens, which is a novel that appeals particularly perhaps to Midwesterners who are apparently, not being one myself, fascinated and terrified by the idea of an earthquake. Because in Behrens' novel, not only does an earthquake actually happen, but it happens when young Hannah's responsible for two young babysitting charges. So Hannah is the heroine of the book, and she's looking after Zoe and Oscar, who are people that she's kids that she's babysitting. Hannah is cut off from her family by a collapsed bridge and cut off from the world by disabled communication systems. She's frightened to death but trying not to show it to the children that she's looking after and she's also left her inhaler at home. So this is a survival story which is different from, from others in a way because she's also looking after two younger children which gives it all the more um, extra jeopardy and it's a book in which Hannah, the heroine, has to constantly be second-guessing 
what the two younger children can cope with when they're in this situation with her and she's got to run as only as fast as the youngest of the kids can run with her. So it's a pretty intense and gripping read, which I would highly recommend, A Disaster Days. Then there's a really good novel also for children called What Storm, What Thunder by Miriam Chauncey, um, which is set in Haiti. And this relates very much to the 2010 earthquake that devastated the 